Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Friday edition, Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Elijah Herbal flying solo today, filling in for Chris Schmidt as he is somewhere in the sky right now between Minneapolis and Omaha, Nebraska. He uh, His flight made it from Indianapolis to Minneapolis uh, earlier today uh, where he had a small layover now somewhere in the air over Middle America. Chris Schmidt back in tomorrow morning for the weekend edition along with Mark Cranach and myself. Uh, But in the meantime, got a show to take you through today as we have a lot of content to bring you from Big Ten Media Days. Chris Schmidt and I have been working hard the past few days getting as many interviews as we can and we got some good ones for you today. So we're going to start it off with James Laurinaitis here in Hour 1 as well as Illinois offensive lineman Doug Kramer coming up in Hour 2. Uh, Fox Sports analyst Brock Heward. We have uh, Zach Van Valkenburg, a defensive lineman from Iowa, and Minnesota running back Mo Ibrahim. Uh, also, Northwestern running back Cam Porter coming up here in about 10 minutes, kicking off hour one. But do we have some news to get into first? As uh, it's been the talk of the sports world, Oklahoma and Texas jumping ship. Looks like they're headed to the SEC. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but first, let's let you know how you get connected with Hale Varsity Radio today. Uh, you can give me a call, 402 466 3776. But uh, as I am hosting, producing, running interviews all at the same time, uh, that's probably not the best way to get in contact with me today. You can tweet at me at Herbal Essences, is where you can get in contact with me on Twitter, as uh, well as my Twitter DMs or uh, via email. Uh, Chris at HaleVarsity.com is how you reach Chris uh, and myself. And then uh, Twitter at Hale Varsity for Hale Varsity Magazine and at ESPN Lincoln. It's another great way to get in contact with me on the show today. Because this news coming out of Texas and Oklahoma is just, well, it's wild based on where we were 48 hours ago as compared to where we are now. Let's take you back. 48 hours ago, we had the text, uh, the report from the Houston Chronicle saying that Texas and Oklahoma have preliminarily reached out to the SEC, gauging interest to see Uh, if the SEC would take them, essentially. And in the past 48 hours, that story has just developed immensely. We've learned today that apparently Texas and Oklahoma have been in contact with the SEC for somewhere around six months, uh, give or take a few months, trying to to reach the framework uh, that would allow them to go join the SEC. And as one uh, Big Ten AD told The Athletic today, uh, they're completely blindsided by this. Texas, not so much. Texas has been uh, a little bit outspoken about the declining TV rights going down in the Big 12. But as for Oklahoma, uh, that was just a shock to the system to Big 12 ADs to hear earlier this week as uh, Oklahoma really has been the face of the Big 12 since Nebraska left. I mean, Texas uh, was supposed to be the face of the Big 12. Uh, you think back to 10 years ago as a Nebraska fan, uh, Nebraska left and we were happy because Texas was the baby of the Big 12, Longhorn Network. Uh, I mean, the Big 12 title game moving to Texas every single year, the Big 12 league offices moving down to Texas. It felt like Texas uh, was the Big 12 conference more than uh, the Big 12 conference was the Big 12 conference. If you get what I'm saying there, it was uh, the, the, the Texas conference. That's what it felt like. And, and that's why I do have a, a bit of a smile on my face today. Uh, not because I'm, I'm happy to see the Big 12 Conference go, not because I'm happy to see Oklahoma and Texas go to the SEC, but because of the way the Big 12 uh, pandered to Texas 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, whenever Nebraska was still doing well in the Big 12 Conference, and Nebraska was still one of the faces of the Big 12 Conference, uh, yet the Big 12 had Texas's best interests at heart. So now to see Texas turn around and stab the Big 12 in the back, uh, if this is the way the Big 12 goes down, uh, I don't want to say karma, But it kind of feels like that as a Nebraska fan. And uh, man, as a Nebraska fan, a week ago you were saying, maybe Nebraska can make it back to the Big 12. And now seven days later, it feels like that is just uh, just a conversation from so long ago. Nebraska sitting pretty in the Big 10. We'll we'll get get into the reasons why Texas and Oklahoma are 
or jumping ship heading to the SEC, re- reportedly, I should say. And uh, the number one reason, when you look at it, is money. We were talking about on the show on Wednesday, me and Will, uh, we're sitting down and saying, why, why does Oklahoma want to go jump ship to the SEC? They're, they're running rough shot through the Big 12 right now, and it feels like two years from now, they'll be getting an automatic bid to the college football playoff every single year. Uh, who stands a, a threat to Oklahoma aside from Iowa State on the occasional year? I mean, Iowa State is not at the point where they're a year-in, year-out threat to Oklahoma just yet. Uh, now, time will tell with that one if Oklahoma even stays in the Big 12. Uh, but it really comes down to the dollars and cents. At the moment, uh, according to the most, uh, the most recent reports out of the Big 12, the 2020 payout to the schools of the Big 12 was $37.7 million. That's a lot of money. Uh, but other uh, reports have indicated that projections put the Big tw- the Big Ten, excuse me, at seventy million dollars per school uh, in three years. Once the new TV rights deal is uh, is up for bidding for the Big Ten at the end of twenty twenty three, that the Big Ten is set to earn seventy million dollars, and that's because Fox has invested heavily in that big noon kickoff, and it's paid dividends for them, and they're willing to shell out some money for the Big Ten because the Big Ten's a good product. As for the SEC, their projections put them at somewhere around $66 million, just right around that, that Big Ten number, uh, whereas the Big 12, as of right now, uh, is unable to get um, assurances that their TV contract is even going to be picked up at the end of uh, 2025 when their deal expires. Uh, the Texas and West Virginia athletic director looked into this earlier this year. Uh, they wanted to know if uh, they could get an assurance that the the Big 12 would have a TV rights deal come the end of their current contract and that that TV rights deal would be uh, lucrative enough for Texas to stick around. And based on what we've seen, uh, Texas pretty quickly after that decided that the Big 12 wasn't for them. ESPN and Fox were unwilling to put an assurance uh, that they would be um, re-signing their TV rights deal with the Big 12. So that's the why. It it all comes down to dollars and cents. Uh, What does that mean for the Big 12? Um, well, right now, most recent reports from The Athletic say that Texas and Oklahoma plan to send a letter into the Big 12 offices uh, on Monday announcing their plans to withdraw from the TV rights deal come 2023. That's an important note. Under the, uh, the Big 12 bylaws, currently, uh, the earliest that Texas and Oklahoma could leave the conference uh, is in the summer of 2023. So before that 2023-2024 football season is the earliest they could leave. Uh, if they do leave on that day, June 30th, 2023, they would be looking at an exit fee of potentially $80 million or more. So it stands to reason that Oklahoma and Texas were looking down the road with this, saying, well, come 2025, SEC, will you have us? That is until Texas A&M, who was kept in the dark reportedly about this entire situation, uh, the SEC didn't want to make Texas A&M mad, so they just didn't tell them they were talking with Texas and Oklahoma. Um, but reports say that as soon as Texas A&M found out, they leaked the story, and that's how the Houston Chronicle got on top of this, because Texas A&M was mad that uh, the SEC would take Texas, another Texas school, into the SEC. And could that speed up the process that this report has now become public? We heard this morning that Kansas has already reached out and had a meeting with the Big Ten about potential expansion, uh, and uh, reports say that Iowa State has as well. And uh, you also hear that schools like Texas Tech, Baylor, and TCU have reached out to the Pac-12 already uh, discussing what they want to do for expansion. So, is this a death nail in the, uh, the Big 12? If all these schools are looking about relocating uh, and the Big 12 folds, I mean, Texas, Oklahoma, all these schools would no longer be subject to that $80 million plus payout come the end of 2023. So what happens to the Big 12 should these reports be true? And based on everything I'm hearing, everything I'm seeing, uh, Texas and Oklahoma do want to get out of the Big 12 as soon as possible. Texas especially wants to get to the SEC. Does the Big 12 turn to Kansas? And I think Kansas is a great option because it opens up that Kansas City market. Topeka is only, what, 30 minutes outside of Kansas City? Less than an hour, I know that. So it opens up that Kansas City market. Do you want to have games at Arrowhead Stadium? Do you want to have a Big Ten championship at Arrowhead Stadium? Do you want to have your uh, your basketball tournament down at the Sprint Center in Kansas City? Uh, and not to mention, it gives Nebraska a new opponent in that West a little closer to home. Does Iowa State want to come to the Big Ten? Those are the first two schools geographically that make a lot of sense. Or does, uh, does the Big Ten go somewhere completely different? Do they go to the Pac-12 to try to get expansion and try to get even more TV rights money? 
uh, an insider for uh, Buckeye 24-7 says that he's heard USC, UCLA, Oregon uh, have all reached out to the Big Ten to discuss potential expansion. Now, most of these reports were coming out. Do we have a, a shred of evidence? No. Uh, but that's how this next week is going to go. It's just we're going to see what sticks. We're going to get into this topic a lot more tomorrow morning on the Saturday morning edition. I'll be back a little bit later this hour and next hour to talk some more. That's the news of the day. But right now, uh, let's get into some of our interviews from Big Ten Media Day because we are loaded up with these. Up first, Cam Porter, Northwestern running back. Here's Schmitty. Sit down with him from earlier uh, yesterday. Back here, Hale Varsity Radio Live, Lucas Oil Stadium. Cam Porter with us, uh, talented back with Northwestern. Uh, you're familiar with uh, Indianapolis in December, two of the last three years. How are you? Yes, sir, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. Just, uh, you just man, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Football's here. I always love talking uh, Northwestern football. And talk to me, Cam, about last season. Was there a tipping point moment? Mm-hmm. Well, a, you were happy to play, but in the season where you said, okay, man, maybe we can put another run together. Um, I definitely think after that big win against Wisconsin kind of opened up our eyes. I mean, we obviously knew we could do it coming into the season, but that really opened our eyes to say, okay, um, we can be competing for a national championship. So, I mean, obviously it didn't go as planned, but, I mean, we see that we can do it and we see that we can play with anybody, which uh, really opened up our eyes. You know, Cam, you look at Northwestern and, and – Right now, it's fair to say Northwestern's not a surprise, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. It's one of those teams now that, okay, uh, Northwestern's something to be reckoned with, and at what point with with your time at Northwestern did you go from, okay, yeah, I want to go here, to the buy-in? When did that flip for you? Um, honestly, I bought in as soon as I visited Northwestern. Um, I saw that Coach Vizier was building something a little bit different. I mean, he uh, does things a little bit different, too. So, I mean, um, once I got up there and saw the culture he was building and um, saw the players and got around them, I understood, okay, this is why this man is successful. So, I mean, I was definitely locked in, and I bought in on what he was selling. So, Can you tell me a little bit about his specifics, just what you're seeing, what you're witnessing, what's his construction process like? Um, the guy just knows how to win, you know. Um, one thing I think that people don't really understand is that he recruits a certain way. He recruits a certain kid. So I think that really bit turn, goes into his success because he recruits a certain type of kid. And that locker room is filled with guys like that, you know, guys that are able to bond and able to get along and are similar. So, I mean, that just carries over onto the field, you know. we got a bunch of guys that want to play for each other and want to win football games for each other. So I think that's a big thing with Coach Fitzgerald is that uh, he recruits a, a certain type of way. So you got a same page kind of mentality from the get-go? For sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. So when it comes to your offense, Northwestern's been really good. Lines of scrimmage have been uh, stout. And then your job's easy, right? Just run the football? Run the football. Simple as that. Simple as that. I mean, our offensive line um, are always great guys, always guys that work their butts off. So, I mean, that's why we usually have success at the line of scrimmage is because of those guys up front. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts with the Nebraska Northwestern series. In your opinion, why are those things so tight? I don't want to say they're weird, right. but they're they're like instant classics mm-hmm. every year. It feels like. I mean, like. I've just I think it's Big Ten West football. I mean, you always know what you're getting into when you're playing a Big Ten West game. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a hard fight. It's going to come down to the end. I mean, we just know what we're getting. I mean, two great programs led by two great coaches, and they're just battling it out. So I think it's just Big Ten West football, and I think that's you know what you're getting when you're playing Big Ten West football. Cam Porter with us here on Hale Varsity Radio at uh, Cam Porter 02. You can see that on the screen uh, where you follow him on Twitter. Uh, as we uh, look to the, the West, you know, how, did, how do you prepare yourself – mentally and physically for the grind because it's not okay you get Iowa okay you get Wisconsin you get Nebraska sometimes you get them all consecutively for sure I mean that's what we're getting this year so I mean I think the biggest thing is just building up your body building up that armor because this is Big Ten football and we're playing a full game slate so um, honestly preparing physically honestly preparing mentally you know knowing your opponent week in and week out studying the game and getting better on that is the keys to being successful in this league What's the uh, what's the new practice? It's newer. It's not brand new, but mm-hmm. 
You're right on the lake, man. That practice facility is just gorgeous. Oh, it's it's amazing. Sometimes I have to pinch myself when I'm looking out there every day. So, I mean, obviously um, that facility has really helped us. You know, um, sometimes I can spend all day in the facility because it's just so much to do. I can watch film. Um, I can get on the field when I want. Um, it's truly a blessing to have that facility, and I'm thankful for it. Tell me about what you're doing academically at Northwestern, prestigious school, incredible uh, mm -hmm. pedigree there. What are you majoring in? What do you What do you like for life whenever it is after football? Right. So I plan on studying uh, learning and organizational change with a minor in entrepreneurship. So um, it's almost considered like a business degree. So um, you basically see how organizations work, what makes them successful, what you can do to improve them. So that's something I'm really interested in. And then just getting a minor in entrepreneurship, I mean, just having that is, is, is pretty cool. You know, you never – uh, know what you wanna might uh, want to create, or you always want to be your own boss. So that's something that um that I'm I'm looking forward to. What's your uh, feelings about name, image, and likeness? This era is new, mm -hmm. and it's there for a lot of guys to be able to eat and get mm -hmm. get uh, get that ability to earn some income from it. Mm -hmm. And also, there'll, there'll be lessons along this curvy road as well. Um, I definitely think it's long overdue. I mean, we're finally getting what we deserve. Um, it's definitely pretty cool to be able to make money off of your name, image, and likeness. Um, I think the biggest thing is just staying focused and understanding that it can be a distraction. But you just got to um, find the best of both worlds. We'll be able to focus in football and also um, being able to uh, present yourself and represent yourself. So I think that's the uh, biggest thing to it is just finding a happy balance with doing it. But I'm all for it. Cam, take care. We see you this, you, this fall. Thanks. Yes, sir. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! It's Elijah Herbal back here on a Friday edition of Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Uh, Big Ten at Media Days. Been covering those the past two days as uh, schmitty has been out in Indianapolis on his way back to Lincoln at the moment. Uh, so that's why I'm taking you through this Friday edition of the show. Uh, coming up right now, we have Chris's sit down with former Ohio State great and former St. Louis Ram James Laurinaitis. He's working now for the Big Ten Network as an analyst. You hear him on uh, college football Saturdays. And Chris got a chance to sit down with him yesterday at Big Ten Media Days. Back here at Big Ten Media Days, Lucas Oil Stadium, and uh, with BTN and uh, great Buckeye James Laronitis with us. James, good to speak with you again here. Uh, finally, going to be a, a normal feeling 2021. How are you today? I'm good. I'm glad we're inching towards that, aren't we? We got at least good to see people again and uh, get all the conference back together. It's it's fun. It means football's close, so I'm I'm excited about that. It, same here. And Week Zero, Nebraska, is where we're based out of. Week zero, you have uh, Brad Biela back in the league, was phenomenal in the Big Ten, and Nebraska and uh, Scott Frost year four, and you have Nebraska fans wanting to, to see an improvement, Coach Frost wanting to see an improvement. Let's start with Nebraska. What's your take on the Big Red as, as you look at them from from your uh, your standpoint, your perch here as, as a national analyst and a guy that works with the league? Yeah, well, I, th I think I'll, I'll echo what a lot of your fan base is thinking is, is now is the time, right, to kind of make that push to show – growth with Scott Frost and his program and there's been a lot of change just with the guard of roster and people leaving and coming in there's a whole lot there but with Adrian Martinez at quarterback and, and his just wow factor ability that he has but you feel like you've been hearing this for year after year right with Adrian and, and obviously he's grown up his maturity his leadership you just want to see that step from Nebraska I, I've been a big uh, supporter of of the Cornhuskers. I do a show in Columbus, mm -hmm. Ohio, and, and I really think for the strength of the Big Ten Conference, Nebraska needs to be at the top of the West. Um, that's not disrespect for, for Northwestern or Wisconsin. It's just that there's so many people who recognize the brand that is Cornhusker football that those schools don't have that deep, rich history that, that Nebraska does. So I would love to see them make that jump. Uh, I don't think they're, you know, due to compete in the West just yet. But you'd like to see some growth. And I think a bowl game needs to happen, absolutely. And you need to see, finally, um, a lot of the conversation about, hey, we're, we're on our way. And, and, look, there's experience this year, it seems like. Um, and Scott talked a lot today about eliminating, you know, self-inflicted mistakes. I've been a part of teams in the NFL that made a lot of those, and those are true. They'll help you along the way. 
Um, but you got to see it this year, and, and, and hopefully, hopefully for the sake of the conference, we do. James Laronitis with us, uh, Big Ten Network. We're talking Nebraska. You know, when it comes to, to Nebraska, growing up in the state uh, as a kid, going to games, same with you, Ohio State, the program, there was just never like a, even like a, an air quote reload year or, yeah. or down year was nine wins, yeah. ten wins. And, yeah. it, you know, T.O. made it look easy. But I look at this group, and even though they are old, even though they are experienced, mm-hmm. there's a lot of super seniors, they, they've only experienced a certain amount of success, and that success has not been postseason. Yeah. How does that, as a guy who played ball at a high level, I mean, you went to Ohio State, and you guys had expectations every year. You had yeah. to come in and live up to them, but how did you realize them, especially with a team yeah. that's not achieved that yet? It's culture, and it's one of the hardest things. You know, we floated around the media, culture, culture. But it really is one of the hardest things to build, too, because I lost nine games in college over four years. Um, and then you get to the NFL and you go 1-15, and, and it was a franchise with the St. Louis Rams that it was 15-65 and 65 before I got there. So there's a lot of people in that locker room that were used to losing and not okay with it, but just indifferent to it. You know, there wasn't this deep passion. Kind of just ground you down. Yeah, to just really hate losing. Like, you have to absolutely hate losing. Like, if you're competitive, it's not even the joy of winning. Like, you just hate losing that much, you know, that you want to avoid that feeling. So I think that's part of what you don't really know the culture unless you're inside that building. Scott will have his thumbprint on it and really feel, does the locker room hate? And you know you have it when you have certain mistakes happen to where you feel like as a coach you have to keep harping on the guys but then when you see the players start to take it over those roles right and so as long as your leaders and the coaching staff are are preaching the same message and and how do we become you know from from an okay program back to a good to a great now we're elite you know because there's different stages it has to take the, the the unified message but it also has to happen in dubs because it's easier for a coach, like, if you come in and you're spitting a bunch of stuff, but you're not winning, like, when you win, for one, everyone's happier. <laughs> They're in a better mood, <laughs> right? But two, you're, you're, it's easier for players to absorb your message. And, and it's funny you bring back the people, the, the super seniors, right, that, that are this year or the experience. I think experience and what's happened, you know, as you read these preview magazines, it's all production, returning production. Look, uh, Illinois last year had a lot of returning production in that defense, and they got torched by Graham Mertz week one. Mm-hmm. If the production isn't very good, it just means that you have a lot of guys that get a lot of tackles on defense. But are they actually elite players or are they not? And I think that's one thing that makes you nervous when you hear about production. For instance, I think Ohio State's ranked like 128th in returning production this year. And, and last time I checked, everyone's expecting them to, to you know win the Big Ten again. So mm-hmm. that's sort of kind of where you're at when it comes to, to the whole returning production. Well, Brett Bielema is walking by us. A return for him to the uh, to the to the conference to the West. You know, what do you think he can do at Illinois? And I look at Illinois as one of these teams that they've had their moments. Mm-hmm. They've given Nebraska problems two of the last three years, and and they're extremely physical. I mean, yeah. they kind of beat the hell out of a lot of teams, but they just don't see it in the wins. I think he can bring wins there. Is that fair to say what, what Illinois can maybe become, be a program that, again, is is going to elevate in the West? And I look at the West in general, man, there's no off week. Yeah. Can you can you recruit like, uh, was it Zook did back in the day? We, Zook we, we lost it. to him in 07. You know, they into a Rose Bowl. Yeah. So that year in 07, they came into the shoe and beat us. And you had to worry about Juice Williams. You had to worry about Rashad Mendenhall, Aurelius Ben. They had a really good defense, and so there was just talent there. I, look, he's going to bring an identity mm-hmm. of tough. They're going to run the football. They have Brandon Peters again. It seems like he's been in college forever. But, you know, they're, they have a certain talent, but it's going to come down to recruiting. Can he put some kind of fence around Illinois and make it a trendy thing to go there again? And, and I think with his pedigree and his development of offensive linemen as well, you'll start to see more big guys want to go there which will help because i think when you try to restart any program i'm sure you've heard this with scott frost over and over the trenches is where league you gotta have it you have to have and you have to have depth i mean you look at the teams who have struggled and and it's been whether it's depth at nebraska whether it's been depth at michigan state when they had all the injuries at the end of mark d'antonio's era it's all about the the o and d lines and it's trendy to say and it's not the sexy positions because you can't really see it on a tv screen mm-hmm. how it's dominating but you can feel it throughout a game you can see it's oh gosh this old line's wearing this d line down or vice versa so uh it, it'll be a very interesting um 
I think, build here to see how Brett Bielma goes about it. But it's going to start with recruiting. James Laronitis, uh, Big Ten Network, college football, Big Ten Media Days, kicked off here in Indy. Last thought here, how has Coach Day continued to, to keep this this torch? And he's still winning the race. I mean, Ohio State's phenomenal. They have got great talent. They're uh, a favorite again to be in the postseason. Uh, you know, Final Four and, and, and bigger and better than that even. And yet, you, just, you guys just don't miss a beat in Columbus. It's been one of the, I think, the pleasant surprises. You know, Ohio State fans have been spoiled. They've had the one year. Look at the last three coaching changes you've had. Yeah, you've, you've and really spoiled. You've killed it. And even since like Woody Hayes, right? Earl Bruce sure. was still in it. Michigan was really good. You know, so Earl had some games there against them. Coop had elite teams, but also struggled against the team up north. But you're, again, it's it's the people look back on the Cooper era and they're like, oh man, like they never really got to over the hump. But they were still winning ten games. They're they just great. lost once to Michigan. They got upset by Michigan State. You know, there'd be one or two games here and there. But we've never had sustained seasons of, like, only six wins or missing bowl games. Uh, obviously, the turmoil when Coach Trestle stepped mm-hmm. down and all those players suspended, um, it, was a, it was an issue um, that season. But they rebounded really quick. And so Urban stepped up what Coach Trestle did in recruiting, made it a really a national scene. And Ryan Day was handed a Ferrari. And we've seen this before, you know, down at Miami. Larry Coker handed a really handed a Ferrari, couple Ferraris, and you, and you drove it off the off the road, right? Mm-hmm. And I think what's prompted Ryan Day up for success, and I think this is why he doesn't get a lot of national credit when you talk about well, top five coaches. He's not as a coach very long as a head coach, mm-hmm. but he still has he's been able to keep Mickey Marotti, who's the strength coach, unbelievable development. Mark Pantoni, who's one of the best recruiting coordinators in all of the country. And and he had Ryan Stamper, who then left with Urban uh, to go down to Jacksonville, who basically took care of a lot of stuff, you know, with player development. And so you're handed all these three guys. You're not bringing in your own guys. So you have a recruiting identity. You have a way to train in the offseason that's already established. But what Ryan Day has done is he has turned Ohio State from – we joke up there about how, you know, when, when you have Michael Thomas signing the richest wide receiver deal, then Zeke with the running backs, mm-hmm. and, you know, the Bosa brothers, and all of a sudden Chase Young, and you see his success. The NFLization of, the, of Ohio State has made it a national program. And then what Ryan Day has done is he's made, wait, hold on, back-to-back first-round picks at quarterback? And that never happened at Ohio State. Ohio State's always had really good college quarterbacks. You look at Braxton, JT Barrett, some of these guys, Troy Smith, mm-hmm. elite college quarterbacks. But now you're, you're getting guys that and, – and those lead to a Quinn Ewers is going to come next year. And, oh, by the way, they have a Kyle McCord and a C.J. Stroud and Jack Miller, one four-star and two five-stars, competing for their job now. And so he's turned it into a quarterback place as well. It's been incredible to see what he's been able to do. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure this is great for college football. The fact that Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio State – all have new quarterbacks, but yet everyone's predicting they still win their conference. It's a it's a point where that position, we've all known it's the most important position, mm-hmm. but you have to hit on it because it affects everything, right? It affects recruiting. you, you got to hit on it twice or, or three times yeah. because one or two are going to leave. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it's a, it's a whole new world, and we'll see how NIL changes everything, right? We'll see how the transfer portal. I mean, mm-hmm. I'll be surprised if all three of those kids I named in this battle are all there this fall mm-hmm. and one doesn't transfer. Um it's a it's a whole new world of college football, but I think once we once we kick it off, we'll we'll love it all the same. Well, we'll uh, try and get in touch with you at different points uh, during this season. But James, good to see you again. Good seeing you. I'll Thanks be out for there. Time. Buffalo at Nebraska. I'll be there. All right. Call well, so we'll, I love, uh, love coming to Lincoln. Well, we love having you in Lincoln. Uh, James Laurinaitis, Big Ten Network, Hale Varsity Live at Big Ten Media Days. So there's James Laurinaitis, BTN analyst, uh, discussing a little bit into Ohio State and the whole new world of college football and. Uh, that world could even change even more here in the next week as uh, Texas and Oklahoma also on our mind today. Uh, hit on that a little bit a few minutes ago. And a reminder that uh, all these segments going to be posted on the ESPN Lincoln webpage as well as in podcast form, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Google Play, wherever you get your podcast. But there he was, James Laurinaitis. Coming up after the break, we got uh, Illinois offensive lineman Doug Kramer. We're going to talk a little bit about what it's like playing in Nebraska as uh, the Illini and Huskers set to square off here in a few weeks. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. 
Welcome back in Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Elijah Herbal sitting in today for Chris Schmidt as he's uh, on the road, I guess I should say in the air, uh, on the way back from Indianapolis, Indiana, Big Ten Media Days as uh, we're just loaded up today, uh, chock full of interviews uh, that we conducted out in Indianapolis with... uh, all the uh, the opponents from the Big Ten West, as well as some Big Ten East teams, uh, coming up right now. We have Illinois defi- uh, excuse me offensive lineman uh, and captain Doug Kramer. Uh, he's going to be taking on Nebraska here in Week Zero coming up. Uh, it's only what, a little over a month away now. Uh, so Chris sat down with Doug Kramer yesterday at Big Ten Media Days uh, to get his take on uh, playing the Huskers and uh, what that Week Zero matchup is going to be like, as well as his new head coach Brett Bielema. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, day one of Big Ten Media Days. Chris Schmidt and uh, starter with uh, the Fighting Illini, Doug Kramer with us. Doug, thanks for a few minutes here, and let's spend time on, on the new head coach, Brett Bielema. What, uh, what, what's been your first impression of your new head coach? Uh, my first impression, you know, back, back in the winter um, was that, you know, he's a great man, and he, I think he is someone that I can trust and that my other teammates can trust. And I think that shows by the amount of super seniors that we came that ended up coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so he is a great guy off the field. And then, you know, when we got into spring ball, you know, we got into the meeting rooms, you could realize how good of a how good of a coach he really is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's he's won Big 10 championships on this field. Um, so, you know, having a guy that has that much that much experience, you know, he's been in the NFL He's won Big Ten championships. Um, you know, he's very smart about football and about the game. And, you know, I think he sees it in a very similar way to, you know, a lot of the offensive linemen, too. Trust such a big word. Coaches talk about it a lot. How, how does a, a guy in that short time frame, even before actual competition, earn your trust? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. That's that's a fact. Um, you know, trust is also extremely important for this game because if one person's not doing their job, the other ten are going to suffer. Mm-hmm. Same th- same thing goes for coaches. Same thing goes for you know medical staff. All of that. You know, it's it's one big family, and that's that's really what Coach B has been preaching this whole time. And you know, you can tell by the by the people that he's brought in. His his assistant coaches are unbelievable. Um, but just going back to that, like, it's really tough to build trust, but the only way you can do it is just day by day. Mm-hmm. Just take it day by day. You know, he wants us up in, up, in, uh, up in his office, you know, coming to talk to him, whether it's about football or whether it's not, you know. So really just getting around him as much as possible, that's, that's really what you have to do. He's got to be kind of in your wheelhouse. He's a big line of scrimmage guy, yeah. right? And, and and that's where you guys have just seen you the last couple, three years uh, against Nebraska. I mean, it's been it's been fierce, man. It's been smash mouth on, on, for both teams. You guys, of course, won in Lincoln last year. Take me back to that Saturday, uh, kind of leading up. Uh, crazy year for you guys with COVID. Yep. And you came into Lincoln and... and Man, yeah, you left with an exclamation point. Um, yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, going into Nebraska every year, we know it's going to be a physical game. Um, you know, Nebraska's defensive linemen are usually some of the strongest, um, some of the most stout interior especially mm-hmm. that I have to go against. Um, I know that those guys are going to be on their game, and I know that they're, they're going to be prepared very well. Um, so you really have to be locked in for that week. Um and it just so happened that last year, you know, our game plan was, was very good, and we came out with a victory. But if you look back at the years past, you know, it's a different story for us. But it's been, it's been, a, it's been a kind of a weird series. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been, it's been back and forth, and, you know, I think that just shows you, you know, the caliber of players on each team, uh, the c- caliber of coaches that have come through and coached on each, each side. Mm-hmm. Um, very strong, and, you know, I, I, I'm just looking forward to – to week zero. Tell me about week zero. You guys get to start a little early. There's no Ireland, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. That that would have that would have been cool. I would have had to start rowing tomorrow to get mm-hmm. there. But it's uh, it, it's gonna be a home game for you guys. But do you feel, I don't know, prepped? I mean, tell me about your your off season workout. 
regiment and just the, the chemistry for Illinois right now? Yeah, so obviously the preparation's not done yet. We got, you know, probably the biggest piece of our preparation, which is fall camp coming up mm-hmm. August 1st. Um, so that'll tell us a lot about our team um, and how we're going to do going forward. Um, but really since since December, since since Coach B came in, you know, we focused on the culture of this university, the culture of our team, um, and that's being tough, smart, and dependable. Um, so really those are characteristics that have nothing to do with, you know, how physical, you know, physical traits that someone has, how high you can jump, how fast you can run. It's all about what's upstairs, what's mentally are you fundamentally sound? Are you willing to do it under adversity? Um, are you dependable to your teammates? So that's really what we've been focusing on as a whole, as a team. And, you know, individually in the weight room, you know, just working on improving your body as much as possible, improving, you know, functional, mo- functional movement for everyone, mm-hmm. improving speed, the, the general things. But, you know, I think Coach Tank's done a really good job with us in the weight room. Um, you know, I love going in there every day and just grinding. I, I bet. You seem like a dude who loves the weight room. Let's uh, wrap here with your running game. Illinois has had some pretty high-level backs historically and recently. Uh, let's talk about the mesh between the O-line and the running game that needs you and you need them. That You can help one another look great. Yeah. I mean, it's all the, – the running game is, is predicated on – you know, the five guys up front, the running back willing to hit the hole. Um, you know, it's the offensive lineman's job to really open up those holes for the running back and just give them space. And, you know, we, we got a back, and we really have a lot of backs. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Chase Brown, the one who, who contributed the most last year, you know, we got him coming back, and he's a he's a one-cut downhill back, and he, he runs extremely hard. And I, I love blocking for him because at the end of the day, I know that he's going just as hard as I am, and I know he's not going to shy away from contact. So, you know, as an offensive lineman, he's he's the type of running back you want you want to you know block for. With with playing the O line, uh, at what point in your football career, as we say goodbye, did it really kind of hit you that man, I can be not just a guy who plays Division One ball, but I can thrive at this. Mm-hmm. You know, at what point at what point in your career did did it kind of dawn on you? Um, well, I certainly I didn't know. My redshirt year. Um, it's a lot of question you know, marks, isn't it? Buried on scout team and and really just figuring out how to be a college athlete. Mm-hmm. You know that that year is really important. But I'd probably have to say, you know, sometime during the next couple of years where you're going against some really good opponents and you realize that you're, you're like, hey, I can, you know, I'm I'm getting movement, I'm getting push, I'm coming off the ball, I'm being aggressive on this guy. Um, so yeah, it's got to be somewhere around that point. Nice to see you. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was Doug Kramer, Illinois offensive line, as uh, they're gearing up to play Nebraska here in a few weeks uh, in the Week Zero matchup. So uh, we're rolling through covering Big Ten media days today on Hale Varsity Radio. We'll have some more thoughts, though, on that Texas-Oklahoma situation uh, coming up after the break and also loaded up next hour. We've got Brock Heward, Scott Docterman, uh, Minnesota running back Mo Ibrahim. Uh, That's all coming up. Uh, later in Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at halevarsity.com. Just try me, try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Friday edition of Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. It's Elijah Herbal in it today. Schmitty. Cranak and myself going to be back tomorrow morning, though, on the Saturday morning edition of Hale Varsity Radio here on ESPN Lincoln for our local listeners and available in podcast form uh, immediately at the conclusion of the show for our listeners across the state. As uh, today, taking you through the big news of the day, Oklahoma and Texas, as well as uh, our coverage of the Big Ten Media Days. But before we get back into that, a reminder about our friends over at West Blue Realty. And if you're ma- looking to make a move this year, you got to give the real estate professionals at West Blue Realty a call today at housing market so volatile right now and uh, they specialize in residential home sales in Lincoln and surrounding communities and they'll help make your next move a smooth one Uh, and if you got agricultural land uh, they can uh, they can handle that too because they have an experienced auctioneer can handle anything
everything from live auctions, sealed bids, and even general land listings. And they've sold land all over the area. I mean, they can handle your land too. You got to call Tom Luby or Kelly Hofschneider uh, to get some more details. You can call Tom at 402 402- 540-3768 or Kelly 402-202-2312 or visit them at westbluerealty.com. Remember, pays to work with West Blue when you're making that next move. You got to ask yourself, what can West Blue do for you? Okay, before we get out of here this hour, got to talk about uh, what this Oklahoma-Texas news means for the Big Ten. Got a little bit into that uh, back at the beginning of hour one, but we got a few more minutes to get into that now because really... Uh, at the end of the day, what it means mainly is that the the Big Ten has to uh, keep up with the SEC, assuming the uh, SEC does, in fact, annex Texas and Oklahoma, um, because really 16-14, it's a numbers game, how many games you can put on TV every single year. And in order to get that TV revenue, uh, you got to add some more uh, just relevant programs. And I think the first that's right off the bat that stands out is Kansas, not for their football program and not for the, the revenue they can generate from football, but for their basketball program. Um, they're such a great basketball program. And really the addition of Kansas to the, the Big Ten just elevates Big Ten uh, even higher uh, if they're not the, the top basketball in conf- the bas- ugh, tripping over my words here. Uh, if they're not the top conference in basketball already, uh, the addition of Kansas really guarantees that for the Big Ten. Uh, so I, I think the addition of Kansas makes a lot of sense just to really solidify your place in the Big Ten. But then you got to go add uh, another powerhouse in football. And uh, dare I say they should also make a run at Oklahoma. Truthfully, because you look at Oklahoma's situation now in the Big 12, and, and we know that this push to leave the Big 12 and go to the SEC was was really pushed by Texas. Texas has been the one uh, leading the study, trying to figure out what their TV rights deal is going to look like at the expiration of this current one. Oklahoma was not a part of that process. Uh, so the question becomes, is Oklahoma just following Texas's lead? Texas has been the the, the power the, the power and the, the decision maker of the Big 12 in recent years. So the question becomes, are they just following Texas, saying if Texas is jumping ship, we got to jump ship too? Or are they sold on the SEC? If, if you're the Big 10, I think you got to put out a feeler towards Oklahoma because you can offer the same in TV rights deal as, as the SEC. And let's not forget, the Big Ten really does provide, I don't want to say an easier path to the college football playoff, but with the addition of Texas, uh, Oklahoma would have to make it through Oak, uh, Alabama, Georgia, Florida's looking better under Dan Mullen. Got to make through Texas too. Uh, the West is no joke. Mississippi State with Leach. We'll see how they turn out in, in the next couple years. We're really in the in the Big Ten. Oklahoma's main threat is just Ohio State. So if you're the Big Ten, do, do, you, do you put out a feeler to Oklahoma? Say, hey, uh, we know you're talking to the SEC, but how would you feel about some Big Ten football? That's what I'd do if I was them. I got a lot more coming up after the break. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back with you, Tail Varsity Radio on the road here, Lucas Oil Stadium, and uh, all Pac-10 quarterback and part of Fox uh, College Football. Brock Ewards with us. It's been a long time since uh, the, the old studio next to KFOR. How are you? It has been. Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah, last year for all of us, right, was just a crazy, mm-hmm. crazy world. I got flipped over to the NFL side when the Big Ten and Pac-12 shut things down, so I'm very thankful my buddies at Fox put me on games every week, kind of bounced around the NFL, and nice to be back home, though, and college football for me is home, seeing these guys, James and Scott and the head coaches, and Mm -hmm. just relationships of almost 15 years in college football, so excited to see people again. Well, Brock, good to see you. We had a a fun uh, free game. We have to go back a couple years. Nebraska, Colorado, you did that game in, in Boulder that yeah. was a, a shootout, looked good early for the folks in red, not so much in oh, uh, uh, in overtime. But yeah. I want to start with Nebraska, and we'll, we'll get you in and out, and thanks for your time. But year four, expectations not real high nationally for Nebraska, mm-hmm. a lot of blowback, new AD, you know Scott pretty well. What's your outlook here on, on, on what this year can be? I mean, because I agree with Scott when it look, when he looks at the talent, 
and talking with some of the guys and covering the program, I think they could be pretty good this year, but there's that wait and see or prove it mentality with, with some in the fan base anyway. Yeah, I think and I think that's fair. I don't think he ducked from that either. Uh, I also think he set the bar a little bit today when asked, you know, on that podium, where is this the best team you've had in four years? And you'll hear a lot of coaches usually dodge that, right? And say, well, each year is different. I don't know. And he was pretty quick to say this is an old team. These are guys that have been here for four years doing it the way we want it to be done, the Nebraska way that it's done. I remember him. I I believe I called one of his first games his first year there. And then he thought, man, you know, we've got some some good guys. that He loved Adrian. He thought Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, he's going to be this just tremendous leader. And he's certainly been on the same roller coaster right next to Scott. But you knew that they weren't his kind of Nebraska fiber guys, mm. you know, that it just wasn't, he wasn't going to bury him, but he just knew that there was a lot of work to do to build the DNA and to recruit the DNA and to do it the way that he wanted it to mm. be done. Well, you're number four. You've got your seniors. You've got your guys with a lot of scars, mm. a lot of wounds, um, hopefully that have been healed and uh, will help them. And they they don't get no easy, you know, right out the gate. People look at that Illinois game and that that's in, at Illinois, Brett Bielema, House Money, year one, 23 super seniors, or 22, 18 seniors, 40 seniors and super seniors on that Illinois team. So, Did yeah. he beat Nebraska or almost beat, he beat Nebraska two out of the first last three years? Yes, right there with them. So that will be a wonderful test. Good chance I'll be there with our crew, which I can't wait. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think I've told you before, and I know I've said it during broadcasts, obviously that one's in Champaign, it's not in Lincoln. There's just something special about Lincoln to me. There's something special about that place. I would have bet a lot of money out of my own pocket if you could, if I could have back then to buy stock into Scott, believing that he was going to turn this thing around. But year four, there's got to be that return on investment now. Well, and it's it's on field action, and let's stick with quarterbacks. Uh, you know that position extraordinarily well. And what do you see in Adrian? What we see is a, a leaner, lighter, quicker mm-hmm. Adrian, but he's also experienced what quarterbacks go through. And quarterbacks, and not being one, but just observing them, <laughs> uh, you guys are special animals, and I mean that as a compliment, where y- you guys, like a lot of people, when there's adversity or even benching, that can mess you up for a while. I think he came through that like mm-hmm. a champ last year. Mm-hmm. Now let's springboard to 2021. You know, what what skill set do you like from him, and how do you kind of apply that for a, a go-out-with-a-bang type yeah. senior year? I think one of the hardest things when you play the position, and when I was a rookie, we had a, a veteran named John Kitna. Okay. He was a dear friend of mine still to this day. He's a high school coach in Texas now. Got kids, actually. One of his sons is with Dan Mola now at Florida. So oh, wow. QB. And I remember, John, that year, Mike Holmgren had come in, and uh, it was just take care of the ball, take care of the ball, take care of the ball. Don't turn it over. Don't turn it over. He, uh, QB coach, great guy, still a friend. But it was, oh, hey, don't do this. Don't do that. And John finally, like, stopped the meeting. He's like, man, if you put me in this box and it's everything I can do, I can't play. Mm-hmm. can't play. And, and, you know, when the turnover bug has been what it's been there, and what were they, minus 11 last year in turnover? It, it was, uh, it's horrific with when you look at one possession games, field position, special teams, and turnovers. So you have these voices, and, and it's similar for you or those that golf out there may feel that way and, and as a quarterback where you're on the putting green and you're like, you know, you just see it. Like, that, that's the line, step up, hit it, I feel great. And then you get to a point where you're like, oh, gosh, if I make this, you know, I break 90. Oh, my gosh, you know, so much. And you know those voices that speak to your head and into your head and on both of your shoulders. And, you know, when I watch quarterback, I feel that. You know, I can sense that from them that, man, they're just fighting it, right? Because on one end, it's like, oh, don't turn it over. Adrian, take care of the ball. Take care of the ball. Don't turn it over. And there were periods where I think because of that, you almost see a paralysis. Like, I don't want to turn it over. I can't turn it over. But then you also can't play. You're not free and easy to use your God-given skill sets and, and talent that you have that Scott loves and many there do. So I would hope by this point, year four now, that, man, that voices and those voices that are just can't do this, don't do this, don't, are just quieted. And those others that, man, here it is. This is, my, this is my final chance here to go out with a bang, to turn this thing around and be the impetus of change right alongside Scott Frost. And the opportunity that presents you for the rest of your life in that state with that fan base and everybody else, you got to just look at that 
and maximize that opportunity and quiet those other can't, can't, can't voices. Don't play scared. Don't play afraid, but uh, don't turn it over either. That's exactly right. That's Brian exactly Keward's right. with us here, uh, Fox Sports College Football, Fox Sports NFL, and uh, radio out in Seattle. Brock, uh, a thought before we say goodbye with uh, what's swirling around. What's your take on Texas and Oklahoma? Mm. You know, what is, what's likely, in, in your opinion, as far as SEC expansion? And then let's, let's look at the Big Ten. Yeah. Does the Big Ten look at that as well. Coach Alvarez just sat down with us. He's like, look, it's not been on our plate. We haven't discussed any expansion. I get it, but if this happens in two weeks, then you'll have reaction from other Power Five leagues. Yeah. What do you think is I like what what do you Kev- going yeah, on? I like what Kevin Warren said, you know, at the podium this morning. Got a chance to spend some time with him yesterday. We are at an inflection point of massive change. Massive change. That's the NIL. That's player empowerment. That's the transfer rule. It's all of it, right? In, in ways, I remember talking to Chris Peterson, the former Husky coach, mm-hmm. and I said, you know, Chris, sometimes, and you you do this, you do it twice a day, and God bless you. I don't know how you do that, <laughs> but God bless you. And you know that at times you got to fight this. Oh man, like, it's never been like this. This is just crazy. This this hyperbole, right, of the moment being so captured in the moment. I said, Chris, it feels like, man, college athletics is just changing. Can you just call me and tell me that it's always been this way? No, it is changing. Massive, massive ways. So whether it is going to be expansion, whether it's going to be contraction, whether it's going to be for super conferences, whether it's going to – anybody, I could tell you right now and have an opinion on it, and you could write it on toilet paper and flush it because uh, no idea. Don't know yet. No, yeah, I don't think any of these people know. But you do know it's about power. You do know it's about money. You do know it's about exposure. And if I'm a Nebraska fan speaking to that audience, I do know I'm in a pretty good spot being in the Big Ten right now. Especially 10 years after the, uh, yes. the earthquake of, of yes. Big 12, the Big Ten. What would you have loved to endorse as a player at, at Washington? Jockey underwear. Okay. No. <laughs> That's <laughs> jockey underwear for a thousand. Um, yes. No. I, you know, I used to back in the day, like Scott Frost, have my little jersey sold, right, as a starting quarterback for three years at Washington. You had a lot of jerseys sold. And I, I remember think. seeing my little number seven and like the Bon Marche or JC Penney's or whatever it was back in the day. And for me, that was like just this huge privilege. Like, oh, that's so cool. You mm-hmm. know, like it was almost a responsibility. Like, man, I got to go out there, play well, perform. I want to win, right? And it, to me, it was so cool. I didn't think, and it's just naivete, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a different era. It's a different time. So I don't say that holier than now. And I was all about the team and these kids are all about them. It's not any of that. But it is neat to see them capture some of that. Mm-hmm. That is their name. That is their likeness. That is them in the video game. That is their jersey number. They are the one performing. So I think it's I think it's healthy to see some of it. I also have no fear that we're now going to just destroy and ruin college athletics because the reality is for 90 percent there won't be a market sure for 95 percent there won't be a market (laughs) you know there'll be a slice of humble pie like man why is it my cousins bought my jersey you know my aunt bought the jersey (laughs) and i got you know six bucks for it so yeah different times but uh but nice to catch up with you and as i said to see the big red machine Mm -hmm. um, in illinois we'll look forward well if if you're out there and we're out there we'll uh, do it again and thanks so much for the time brock you got it it was brock heward with us here on hail varsity radio as uh brock touched a little bit there at the end about uh, the changing landscape of college football and what what could be coming. And uh, he nailed it. We don't know. We really do not know what is coming in the world of college football. Is that scary? Is it exciting? A little bit of both. Uh, I guess time will tell. Now turn our attention to Iowa. As uh, Scott sat down this morning with Iowa defensive lineman Zach Van Valkenburg and also Scott Doctorman. Up first here is his uh, sit down with Zach Van Valkenburg. Back into it here at uh, Lucas Oil Stadium. It's Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Zach Von Valkenberg, defensive end with Iowa, is with us. Nice to see you. How's uh, how's your morning going? Uh, good. We just flew in from Iowa City a couple hours ago. It's been a little early morning, but you know, used to that. Zach, tell me your story, bud, about uh, being a Western Michigan kid, growing up uh, in that state, and then and then grad transferring here to Iowa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a... Uh, it was a really cool experience. Uh, obviously, I have a lot of appreciation for some of the things that, uh, you know, the nice things we get, the good food, all, all that sorts of things. Um, but, uh, you know, the interesting part of it is I chose Iowa because the coaching staff was so similar to the coaching staff I had uh, 
in, in, uh, at the D2 level, really guys of character. Um, and that's what brought me to Iowa, and I've been really happy with that decision. So you mentioned the character, and what what is a an action or kind of a trait when it comes to character, being able to sniff that out as a player uh, when you have a coach? You have the recruiting process that kind of is a fairy tale, mm-hmm. and then you have the day-to-day where you're around this person, position coach, head coach, assistant, whatever the case may be. That, that person's kind of got to be the same all the time, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I think a lot of – it was nice being able to go through it twice. A lot of recruits, uh, they're used to the recruiting process. They're used to, um, you know, being courted. And then when they get there, well, it's time to start working. You're back at the bottom. And <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of jarring for some guys. And uh, being able to go through that twice, I I, uh, I knew what to expect. And I knew kind of how to, how to, you know, like you said, sniff out – who is going to BS meter? Yeah, who's going to who's who's going to be the one that you know changes up once you are actually start once you actually start playing? And I think I did a really good job because I feel like I'm in a great spot here. Tell me about this uh, this Hawkeye defense, uh, very stout historically, and uh, a a really solid unit last year. You know what what are you looking forward to when it comes to up in your game, and you know what steps do you need to take? individually and then as a unit you know what's the ceiling look like yeah so first of all like you said um you know historically really stout unit because uh coach phil parker has a great system um and uh you you might wonder oh who's going to be the next guy you know how's that going to look well it's a a good system and uh everyone's really unselfish and they play their role so it uh in the end of the day if everyone knows their role it doesn't really matter who you plug into that um and so we're really excited for some of the, you know, the young guys, especially on the D-line, to get their shot. What, um, what was that process like for you to, to learn your job and mm-hmm. then get comfortable at it? Yeah, so um, it was definitely a process. I was uh, you know, playing behind A.J. Epinesa and Chauncey Golston, so those are two really good guys to uh, you know, try and emulate. Um, in 2019, played a little bit, wasn't, wasn't, too, uh, wasn't too versed in the defense, but I was, I was learning. And then when got my shot in 2020, uh, Things turn out pretty well, so I'm hoping that that same process can be replicated uh, for some of the younger guys. Did those guys treat you like a little brother in a good way, as far as kind of paying the information forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, it's a little strange because, like, you know, AJ Epinesa, he's he's younger than me, but yeah, it was kind of like he's, he's he's further ahead. So you, you need to you need to listen to that guy. He knows more than you, and that's you know that's a humbling experience, but it's also um, it's one that definitely is rewarding. Hell of a player. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. really, really good. Zach von Valkenberg with us here, Iowa defensive end. Let's get into it. Uh, neighboring states, Nebraska, Iowa, down to the wire finishes the last mm-hmm. several years. What What's your take and feel being a guy that transferred into it on the Nebraska Iowa series rivalry? Can I call it a rivalry? Do you think it's a rivalry? Yeah, absolutely. And I and I think uh, you know coming from Michigan, there's a uh, there's real, a lot of bad blood between Michigan and Ohio, that sort of thing. I don't think it's the same. I think there's a lot of respect. Um, I think you know, 364 days a year we're neighbors, and uh, it's the one one year you know one day a year where uh, where it's not. Yeah. And, I, and and I think that's a that's a really good uh, really good thing for both of our states. What 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 do you respect about playing Nebraska with their offensive line? What have you noticed about the offensive line? Uh, I think they're definitely uh, you know. Uh, a really tough crew. Um, like you said, the games, they're always really close. They they play really tough. Um, and, you know, you can't expect anything but a close game. They're, they're not going to quit. Iowa football, and uh, let's talk 2021. Zach, before we say goodbye here, you look at the Iowa State non-conference game, you look at your, your West schedule, and then the crossovers. I know you guys got to kind of zero in on, on one game at a time, but Overall here, you know, what can this uh, team do? Can you be back here in December? Can you be back in, in Lucas Oil playing for another Big Ten title game? Yeah, I think we're absolutely capable of that. Now, uh, whether that happens is going to be on us. It's not It's not so much our opponents. Our real opponents going to be ourselves. Um, and I think, you know, that's going to happen during camp. It's going to happen in, the next, in these last couple weeks of the off season. That's where the real work happens. Um, and then you see the results during the season. That's uh, – it's kind of like a you know a rocket taking off. Mm-hmm. All the preparation happens years before that, you know weeks before that. Um, that's just kind of the result. Zach, it's good to meet you, man. I like Absolutely. hearing your story. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. And uh, see you on Black Friday. Sounds good. <laughs> and we're back, fellas. I think we could 
Listen to the radio listen. On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Lucas Oil Stadium, day two, uh, Big Ten Media Days. Chris Schmidt, Hale Varsity Radio, ESPN Lincoln. Scott Docterman with The Athletic and uh, Nebraska, Iowa. Scott, it's great to, to see you, and yeah. it's been so much fun talking Nebraska, Iowa, when uh, the, uh, the the two uh, border uh, neighbors meet. And, and wow, what uh, what a season Iowa could have. Let's start there and kind of get your take on what's returning, what needs to be uh, reloaded, and your, your overall outlook for Iowa. Kirk should have a pretty good ball club again. Yeah, I think they'll be a very competitive team, and I think it's uh, it's kind of typical where in, in, there are really two areas for me that I look at that I think that could prevent them or elevate them, and that's quarterback play, and I think that's defensive line because they had a dominant defensive line last year and last couple of years, frankly, and uh, where they lost three starters, and I and they have some, a lot of young players who are really talented, but they're unproven. So I don't know if they can step right in and be – Certainly not as good as Davion Nixon and Chauncey mm-hmm. Golston and then previously A.J. Epineza and those guys. But I think that if they can be at least uh, competent, then I think they'll be a, a, you know, a pretty good team. And then, of course, Spencer Petras and how he improves. If he improves, I think that's going to be the, really the key to the season as to whether uh, we were back here in Indianapolis in December or we're in some place like Nashville or, or mm-hmm. you know, Vegas or the Outback Bowl for the 15,000th time. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I think that those are the, really the two keys for Iowa from being 8-4 and four and to maybe 10-2 and two and beyond. Scott Docterman here from The Athletic. Uh, we're talking uh, Big Ten West, Iowa, Nebraska, here on Hale Varsity Radio, Big Ten Media Days. What's your read and take here on, on the Iowa fan base? And there's an awful lot of trolling and response and hand grenade throwing between the Nebraska fan base and, and the Iowa fan base on social media. And then it, it ramped up a little bit earlier in the week with uh, the Nebraska posting and then the Iowa response about uh, encounters and sharks and uh, series history here, right. the last six six meetings between Nebraska and Iowa. I love it. I love the it's fact fun, that, isn't yeah, it? when you get teams that can kind of chirp back and forth and fan bases that can do that, that's the essence of rivalry in sport. And I think that's what this uh, – the sport needs, and I think the series needs that. You know, when I, I remember when Nebraska joined, and they were kind of stapled together last in the Legends Division, and that first game in Lincoln, it felt like flat champagne. I think both <laughs> fan bases were hoping for something, and then they really weren't playing for anything, and it was just kind of like blah. And really, over the last 10 years, there's only been twice where, uh, you know, some sort of divisional title or, or trophy was sort of at stake. I mean, in Iowa in 2015, it was a perfect season. And then for Nebraska in 2012 at Kinnick Stadium, you need more of those games. You, you know, and they've had entertaining games that have gone down to the wire the last few years. And uh, But, you know, they're kind of at different stages. And, and so I think what we need, I think both fan bases need, everybody con- collected to this needs is games that matter and for both fan bases. And not just, hey, who's going to finish second in the division, but there's something at stake, and if you can get a winner-take-all for the West Division crown between these two teams at Lincoln this year or Iowa City next year or beyond, then I think you'll see an elevation to this where I think both team, both fan bases will recognize this as this is a really – they already do recognize it as an important game, but I think it, it kind of takes that next step to become, you know, a, a really a, a qualified rivalry. Well, think about this. I mean, it's it's gone beyond does Nebraska get to a, a bowl game because you've, you've got a – a five and seven season there, uh, with with Duncan at the buzzer, yeah. hitting another field goal <laughs> that kept Nebraska home. And you know, I was been around that eight nine win total. But yeah, if you have both programs step up, where it is winner take all on Black Friday, that'd be a lot of fun. Scott Docterman's here uh, with the Athletic Big Ten Media Days, uh, Nebraska and Iowa. Our topic du jour, and you know, when you look at Nebraska in year four from afar, what's your take? And, and I guess, how did you process yesterday with Nebraska? They're picked fifth. Uh, Nebraska, like, they get it. They need to be better. They need to prove it on the field. Trev Alberts uh, now in charge as AD. And I think Scott and Trev were on the same page yesterday, which was great. Now, uh, moving forward, can Nebraska be better? How do you see Nebraska this season? We know the schedule, but are you kind of wait and see mode? Or do you think, all right, Nebraska could take some steps, make some steps? Steps, some steps towards 
progress here and and maybe making that Black Friday matter a little more. Yeah, I think they can. I, it's just a matter of kind of doing it in some ways. I mean, I, I look at the program and I, I, I'm just kind of trying to find an identity. And, a, you know, an offense, you kind of know what they want to do, but uh, doing it and doing it consistently. And I think playing consistently because you look at what happened last year it, from Illinois, that game was, I watched it, I'm like, whoa, this does not look good at all. Does that happen after Penn State? Y- yeah, right? you, you, you beat Penn State, which is, you know, they were down a little bit, but still that's a quality win against a good opponent, and you feel feel good about yourself, and then you let down that way and play so poorly, and then you come to Iowa City and play a very good game, and Iowa actually played probably one of its worst games that day. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they won their last six games by 14 points or more, so I think, you, you know, being able to be more consistent week in, week out. I like what the defense has. I mean, so many super seniors back. I think that's a really good start. Um, offensively, um, I like a lot of what Adrian Martinez does. It's just a matter of making sure he, you know, to emphasize what he does well. He's not necessarily a deep passer or, or, or anything like that, but he's great on his feet. He's a really accurate guy. You know, try to emphasize that. Marky Stepp was, uh, is going to be a very good player in this division. He's he was a highly touted recruit, um, went to USC. I think he's, he, he's got the potential to be maybe one of the be- five best running backs in the Big Ten. Um, good wide receiver core. I know Oliver Martin well. Uh, he, and his, he and my son graduated together in, in high school. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential there. But can they be consistent week in, week out? And can Nebraska, you know, I know 30 years ago this is, wouldn't even be a statement, but can they compete along the line of scrimmage for four quarters against Wisconsin and Iowa and probably Minnesota, at least their offensive line? And that's going to be the key to whether it's, uh, you know, maybe you scratch out to get to a bowl game versus hey, maybe you'll be competitive and, and have an outside shot the last couple of games against some really good teams. To, to maybe get to Indianapolis. Scott Docterman with The Athletic here, Hale Varsity Radio. Last thought, Scott, and you mentioned, uh, you know, that, that, that margin of you hanging on or are you excelling? I want to go back to, to Oliver Martin, and Nebraska's reshaped and revamped their body type at wide receiver. They needed to. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what, what do you think, knowing Oliver a little bit like you do, what can he bring to Nebraska's passing game, you know, what, what are his strengths, his skill sets? I mean, none of us have seen him mm-hmm. ball other than, you know, in, in some of the spring games, and, and he looks pretty dependable. Yeah, he does. And, uh, you know, he he was only at Iowa for a year, unfortunately. I think that was a, a bummer for him and, and for everybody. But he does have the uh, – he does have a, a, a great physique. He's very strong. He's athletic, great pass catcher, and really – uh, you know, by and large, he's a really good route runner as well. And I think I don't know how much of special teams he'll have, but I know from watching him grow up, uh, you know, he could be a, a tremendous punt returner. And uh, so I think he's got other elements. And I think you know, you immediately you kind of look at him as possession receiver, but he does have some speed. He does have some strength. I think he's he could be a real essential player in this offense, especially if he's. Uh, you know, he doesn't necessarily have to run the deep routes. Uh, what, o- Omar Manning, is it? You know, you yeah, know, you got Omar, you have Betts. And can he be a, a, a Westerkamp type guy? Is oh, that, yeah. Is that a yeah, fair comp? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good comp. comp? Yeah, yeah, I would say because, you know, Betts is kind of your home run hitter. Omar Manning looks the part of being in, you know, you what, a, do whatever A.J. He wants. Green, you know, out there. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the the transfer from uh, – Toure is going to be money in the slot of, yeah. with his size and mm-hmm. skill set. I mean, they, they've got the players there. Can right. You, can you get time? <laughs> exactly. But I think Oliver might be your guy to, you know, either extend drives, make plays, catches. Maybe he's not going to be your home run hitter, but but he, if he d- plays that role well and kind of is the almost the, the outlet or the drop-off guy, I mean, I, I think he can do that and maybe end up with 50 catches or more and, and extend drives, and that's probably what you need out of him. He's He's got more gifts than your typical, all right, possession guy. Yes. But he can still be a really good possession guy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's he's an upper level possession guy. I mean, I think the stereotype kind of puts him at possession, but I don't think he's a, yeah. a true possession. Well, sure. Scott, this will be fun. We'll see how the uh, the West navigates uh, with Wisconsin. You know, how does Wisconsin kind of get knocked off this year, either by Iowa, by Minnesota, by Nebraska, by Northwestern? You know, what what could be 
uh, the Achilles heel for Wisconsin this year. Is it quarterback play too? It could be. Um, Graham Mertz started off so amazing against Illinois last year, and we just and, and then in Michigan as well. And you thought, okay, this guy is a real deal. And then I saw him; he was very pedestrian in Iowa City. Um, and you know, part of that was because some of his best players, two his two top receivers, his top running back was out. Uh, but you know, it was 28 to seven. Iowa won decisively, and so I think he needs to take that next step, just like Spencer Petras does at Iowa. Uh, and uh, they ended up with real similar statistics, and I think it's a matter of him taking that next step. I think they've got a really good defense, as always, in place. They've, they don't have the great running back that they've had for well, quite a while now. Um, and so, uh, you know, can Jalen Berger be a, you know, a good running back, a top five, six in the Big Ten? I don't know. And he's certainly not a Jonathan Taylor. I know that. So I think it's just going to be a matter of can people line up and, and slam it with them. And Iowa has proven it can. Um, but can. Northwestern has proven it can at times. And I think everybody else has just got to kind of catch up to them. Yeah. Scott, good to see you. Great to see you. Hey, man, thanks yeah. for coming by. Yeah. We'll step away and be back. Uh, Hail Varsity on the road here. Media Days, uh, Scott Docterman with The Athletic. So that's uh, Chris's sit-down with Scott Docterman, uh, beat writer for Iowa for The Athletic. Pretty insightful interview there from Scott as uh, we're rolling through our coverage of Big Ten Media Days. Chris currently flying back from Indianapolis. He's going to be back in tomorrow morning for the Saturday morning edition of Hale Varsity Radio. So we're going to do a little more reacting uh, to that Texas and Oklahoma bombshell report uh, that they're going to be jumping ship from the Big 12 heading to the SEC. Unsure of when that could happen. Uh, their initial plan was uh, 2023 at the earliest, but who knows? Everything's kind of up in the air at the moment. It feels like every single hour we're getting a new report out of uh, SEC country about what's going down between Texas and Oklahoma. So a lot more reaction coming up to that tomorrow as well as uh, throughout all of next week here on Hale Varsity Radio. But well, one of the things uh, to mention there is uh, we kind of talked about that, uh, that rivalry between Nebraska and Iowa uh, in the Big Ten, and the question becomes if – Kansas and Iowa State are the two teams that uh, the Big Ten decides to add in response to the SEC, add in Oklahoma and Texas. Do you think Iowa State and Iowa could become the Black Friday matchup for the Hawkeyes? Uh, I mean, obviously this is so far down the road uh, that uh, it's uh, not too important, but it is one of those things that that's on my mind as you, you look at it and you go, well, that, that interstate matchup seems like a, a bit more of a of a draw for the uh, the Iowa fans, even though this Nebraska and Iowa relationship is really blossoming into something uh, something decent. So you wonder, do you keep Iowa Iowa State uh, to kick off the Big Ten season? Should Iowa State come? Uh, because that's when they play now. They play at the end of the non-conference, and I'm excited to watch that game this year. Uh, but if Iowa State is the team to come join the Big Ten, then they they get moved to Black Friday. Who knows? There's still a lot more that needs to happen before that. But uh, we've got uh, Minnesota running back Mo Ibrahim coming up next on Hale Varsity Radio. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hail Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut, preteen Swedish boy. All Big Ten back, uh, Mohammed. Uh, Ibrahim is uh, to my right here at Lucas Oil Stadium, 1,700 yard rusher in the Big Ten. Uh, Mohammed. Uh, in, in a crazy year last year during COVID, you were the only guy in the league to average over average over 100 yards on the ground. Touch a little bit here on on navigating last season and kind of the rhythm you had with your offensive line. What meant you guys were so impressive running the ball? Yeah. Um, so thank you for having me on the show first. Hey, thanks for working with us. <laughs> as you guys are first up, and uh, Muhammad, it's nice to, to spend time with you. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, COVID was a you know hard year last year. Um, you know we had so many uncertainties throughout the whole year. Um, so you know just getting those Zooms calls with your O lineman and just breaking down the plays and uh, learning what the O line is doing. Learning they're learning what I'm looking at and uh, you know we we was able to work together. Um, so uh, coming to the season, um, you know we gelled together. Um, as a unit, and uh, we got the run game uh, going. Um, and, you know, you've seen it throughout the year. It got better and better as we uh, got used to, you know, playing with each other because, you know, we didn't have a spring ball that year. Uh, so uh, our first reps together was in August. So, um, you know, it was a weird year, but, you know, we, we put it all together by the time the season came. Mohammed, uh, 
Abraham with us here, Minnesota running back as uh, we're here, KFOR live at Lucas Oil Stadium. Take me back to the Nebraska game. You guys came in with 30 or 35 players down right. due to COVID, and you guys still found a way to win in Lincoln. What did, what did that – what was the mindset going into the Nebraska game? Was there any doubt, any fear? And then how did you push forward in, in tight ball game? How did you push forward and, and pull that win out? Right. So, uh, you know, going into that game, we didn't know if we was going to be able to play that game or not because, uh, you know, the COVID restrictions and uh, we was getting close to the limit. So, uh, you know, preparing for that game, you know, we're dropping players and stuff like that. And, uh, we, you know, we get to game day, 35 people out. But uh, throughout that whole week, you know, we just kept it simple. Um, you know, the, the young players were playing most people first starts and stuff like that. So um, it was just good just letting those young guys get experience. Uh, and then throughout the game, you know, we went through very hard sh- – a lot of hardships and stuff like that so uh it was a tough game close game uh we barely made it out but we came out with a w and uh it was a tough fight tell me a little bit about your your regiment how you stay fresh how you stay healthy you've been doing it for a while in the big 10 and you you've been a premier back in the big 10 and there's been no drop off but continued excellence uh take me through uh kind of your focus and how you've you've navigated as your careers continued? Um, I give that to Coach Fleck and our trainers. Um, you know, after the game, you know, the next day they come up to me and ask me what do I need uh, to work on that week. Um, if it's ankles, if it's hamstrings, if it's any problems, uh, we attack it throughout the whole week. Uh, I still get my practice in, I still get my reps in, but you know they take care of me um, on and off the field. So uh, I give that to them, just keeping me fresh, keeping me uh, ready to go for the next game. What is it about Coach Fleck that uh, it's one thing to to think you want to go to a place, right? And it's another thing once you get there to buy in, especially right. when you have the the portal available now. Uh, what is it about uh, the Minnesota culture that that kind of hits home with you? Coach Fleck is consistent. Uh, you know, his energy is very consistent. You see it online. Uh, uh, you know, I see it firsthand. But, you know, you, whatever you see online is how he is every day. Uh, after a loss, same energy. After a win, same energy. Uh, and that's what I, I really like about Coach Fleck is that when I walk into the building, I know what I'm getting every day. I'm getting a consistent energy, high 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 energy type of guy. Uh, and he's going to bring me up. Uh, if I feel down, he's going to bring me up to his level. And, uh, and, and that's what I love about him. And it's more, it's more than football with him as well. Um, it's a life program. You know, we, we, we do more stuff than just uh, – we do more stuff than just football. You know, we, we, love, the, we love to talk about life stuff. Uh, he asked me about what's going on in my life, and uh, that's what I really enjoy. Mohammed, I'm curious. Since COVID started a year ago in February and uh, ex- right. sort of and plagued everybody, so did this season? Do you feel like you're just you're physically, you're emotionally more prepared to play than say you were when the season started last year? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, I I found that you know being around my teammates are very helpful. Um, you know, you take it for granted. Uh, you know, years prior, but not being with them this uh, last year, uh, it, it really it sucks to be honest. Uh, just not being around them and just having that energy to just bring you up. You know, you got to bring that up by yourself at home on Zoom calls. Uh, so just being around them, having their energy, uh, practice practicing with them again and stuff like that just made it way better. Minnesota running back uh, Muhammad Ibrahim with us here on uh, KFOR. Schmidt, Carroll, Dale, and Jeff, and uh, the Gophers picked kind of in that top three with the Big Ten and uh, not far removed from an 11-2 and two season. Uh, incredible run, co-Big Ten champs. Uh, as you look at, at expectations, where do you think the program's at right now? Do you consider yourself kind of off of that underdog uh, dark horse label, or do you even do you even pay attention? Yeah, bugs are around here. It's not. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Me and Muhammad have been swatting at gnats around here, but to, or or do you think now Minnesota's kind of on that that playing field of a serious contender? Usually, it's Wisconsin or Iowa, but there's been in continued talk, and you guys have earned it. Minnesota being a threat to the West and more. Uh, I don't think that uh, we should be worrying about that right now. Uh, as a team, we ne- we just got to get better as a unit. Um, you know, get better, better each day. And we're not worried about the results, uh, you know, because 
what we call success is not what other people call success. Uh, last year, our whatever record we had, we call that a successful season just because of what we had to go through and stuff like that. So um, success varies, and uh, what we call success might not be what other people call success. So we just keep our head down, get better and better each day, and that's how we got to look for it. You know, was there a turning point moment to, to last year's season where, because I know it started off a little rough, at what point in, in 2020 did, did things flip in your opinion? Um, I would say after like probably the Nebraska game, just knowing that, you know, 35 people are down and, you know, we were still able to win. Um, you know, it just brought the, the energy back up in the, in the whole facility. Um, just knowing that, you know, together, uh, we can get things accomplished if we work together. So, well, we have been blessed to have time with, uh, Mohammed Ibrahim, the uh, running back for the Gophers, 1700 yards last year, uh, you just need shy of 2,000 to become the all-time leading rusher. Right. And uh, it'll be a, a ball game in October, Minnesota hosting Nebraska. And, uh, Mohammed, hey, thanks for joining us on KFOR this morning, and uh, we'll see you around the, the rest of the media days. a pleasure to see you again. Thank you for having me. So that was Mo Ibrahim, Minnesota running back. He's returning for his senior year this season and uh, excited to see what he can do for the Govers, except uh, in that Nebraska game, obviously. He sat down with uh, Schmidt and Carol yesterday on the uh, KF4 Morning Show, replaying it here on Hale Varsity Radio. And uh, that's plenty of content we've had up at uh, Big Ten Media Days. And... Uh, Man, just what a couple of days as we are getting closer and closer to football season. We return here on Hale Varsity Radio. Going to get Noah Vedrill's thoughts as uh, he took the podium today at Big Ten Media Days. Uh, Rutgers quarterback, former Husker quarterback. Uh, his thoughts coming up next. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Wrapping up a Friday here on Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. It's Elijah Herbal filling in for Chris as he is on his way back from Big Ten Media Days out in Indianapolis. As uh, today, a lot of the Big Ten East teams uh, hitting the podium. So we had uh, Ryan Day of Ohio State. We had Indiana. We had uh, Rutgers. We had Iowa uh, all uh taking their part in Big Ten Media Days. And uh, where I'm going with this is uh, a former Husker in the pride of Wahoo. Uh, That's Noah Vedrill. He's uh, all geared up to be Rutgers starting quarterback in 2021, rocking a new haircut, some uh, some salad up top for Noah Vedrill as uh, he's rocking the long hair for this upcoming season. And... uh, uh, excited to see how Vedral plays this season, especially because Nebraska and Rutgers are not matching up this season. So you get a root for Noah Vedral without having to root against Nebraska. And, and he kind of discussed about what it's been like uh, since he's been at Rutgers, watching Nebraska on TV now instead of being uh, on the sideline or on the practice field. And uh, it was pretty insightful to hear uh, from Rutgers starting quarterback today. I have a lot of friends on that team still that I would consider close friends of mine. And um, obviously you root for the people you're close with. So and I would see some of their games maybe through like film watching. You kind of watch game cut ups and TV copies to get ready for other teams. And they'd be in the breakdown for that week. And I'd watch and kind of if I saw a play that one of my buddies made, I might send them a text. Be like, hey, nice job. Or maybe they trip on the grass. I might send them that one. <laughs> so, uh, so Noah Vedral talking about the relationship he still holds. Uh, with his uh, former Husker teammates. We heard from Greg Schiano today as well, uh, who hit on Noah Vedral, calling him a, uh, a student of the game, a very smart quarterback, athletic, unselfish, and a guy who really respects his teammates. And uh, the direct quote here is, he's been everything we were looking for at quarterback. When you have those traits, success is going to come. And uh, Schiano obviously very excited uh, for the prospect of Noah Vedral's senior year out at Rutgers. And uh, I personally very excited as well as uh, he started six games last year. Um, injury uh, slowed Noah Vedral. We didn't get to see him in that Nebraska Rutgers game because of injury. Uh, but Noah Vedral, obviously we're rooting for him. And it's going to be interesting to see how uh, Noah Vedral at Rutgers stacks up to Adrian Martinez at Nebraska because, I mean, 
whenever Noah Vedral is the backup to Adrian Martinez and goes somewhere else and wins a starting job in the Big Ten. Uh, you can talk about the level of Rutgers all you want, saying, oh, Nebraska is a, a better program. Um, but at the end of the day, all that matters is your performance and your play on the field. Noah Vedral uh, looked impressive in his, uh, his action last season. And uh, what does that mean? for Nebraska and for Scott Frost and, and for Nebraska's just situation as a whole if Noah Vedral goes out to Rutgers and outperforms Adrian Martinez here at Nebraska. Uh, just because it, it really felt like at, at times uh, during Noah Vedral's last season here, it really felt like the, the fans at least thought that Noah Vedral should have gotten a shot on the field. He's getting that shot at Rutgers and uh, hoping for the best from Noah Vedral this season. Before we let you go, got to remind you uh, – that uh, nearly 70% of people in fatal crashes in the state of Nebraska are not wearing a seatbelt. If used properly, a seatbelt can risk reduce the risk of fatal injury by up to 60%. Your best defense in any crash is to buckle up. It's a message brought to you by the Nebraska Department of Transportation Highway Safety Office. Going to have more reaction to that Oklahoma and Texas news tomorrow morning on the Saturday morning edition of Hale Varsity Radio. As Schmidt is going to be back as well as uh, Mark Cranach joining us all the way up from Omaha. As uh, Should have a fun one for our local listeners here on ESPN Lincoln. That one as well as this show going to be available in podcast form. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, HaleVarsity.com or on YouTube is where you find us. Back tomorrow, Hail Varsity Radio.